Okay, just as a bit of familiarization, uh, or just to get you more familiar with Locate, uh, this software actually sprang from a search that uh, happened in Canada, and then one subsequently that happened in, in your state. And uh, let me get over here and make sure you guys can see this. I'm going to share my screen, I think. Okay, it is not letting me share my screen for some reason. Maybe you make him a co-host, Nick? Yeah, that's what I'm doing right now. Although I think everyone should have the ability to screen share. They should. I, I made them go just in case. And then I also asked them to, to share the video to see if that pop up came up for them. There we go. I can see your video. Okay. And the video is up. I can, yeah, I, I can see the video yourself. I can't see your slides. Okay. All right, yeah, I've got to be able to, to share my screen. And for some reason, it won't let me uh, share my screen. Anybody have is it, any suggestions? Is it, giving you a, is it giving you an error message, Gene? Your, your no, I shares? have my uh, my... I've launched the Zoom meeting and I can see you, but. Uh, and when you hit share screen, what what is it? What comes up? I don't I don't get to share screen at all. Okay, there, there's. Do you have a toolbar at your at the this bottom of your screen? See. I do not. Hmm. Well, I am going to just quick share my screen, flicker it on and off, and see if that changes anything for you. Okay, what? I'm going to uh, try to reach the meeting. Otherwise, Gene, sure. if you, oh, here if we you, go. You got it. We're about to get it, I think. Okay. Aha, uh -huh, here it comes. All right, now we can see your screen. Okay. This is the interface to uh, locate. And uh, one of the things, a um, li little background on me, I've been doing search and rescue with drones for uh, 16 years now. And uh, one of the problems that we've always had with, uh, with, uh, with what we do with drones is the data we collect. We collect a lot of data. And that data is in the form of either still images or in video. And one of the things that you have to do is you have to parse that data. And when you're in a situation that's a, that could be a life and death situation, minutes matter. So we end up having to go through each one of those images using the standard issue Mark One eyeball and a good, we call that squinting images. And uh, a really, really good squint can go through a 20 megapixel image in two to three minutes. Of course, if you have a thousand images, the math is pretty easy. It's gonna be 3000 minutes. Uh, and that's a long time to wait to get actionable intel. And uh, as I was st stating earlier, the software itself sprang from another search in Canada and one there in Wisconsin where they looked through about 3,000 images and they did not find the individual that they were looking for and said, there's gotta be a better way. So this individual came up with an idea of being able to scan a 20 megapixel image and pick out colors. And the software was developed where you actually used what we call the bloodhound method. You could take a sample of 
say blue jeans. You can just take a picture of your own blue jeans and use that as a sample to open up in a database. And see, just like I've done right here, this is uh, the spectrum databases that we have. We could add that spectrum database in there and we could tell it what color we're looking for. Then the software would go out and it, pixel by pixel, it would look through 20 million pixels and see if it had a match with one of those things. Now, as you can imagine, you know, the, 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 the algorithm to get that done is, is pretty significant. But when you get right down to it, it's just numbers. We deal in three primary colors red, green, and blue, right? And those have a value of zero to 255. And that's what makes up the approximately 16, 17 million colors that can be present in a JPEG image. So when you get right down to it, the math on the surface is very easy, but to do it very quickly is, is a little different story. And we discovered that while this was really, really good, and we could, we could find the, the pixels, sometimes it was very difficult to get the range correct so that you would include the pixels that you wanted. So while that worked well for us, we came up, the, the developer came up with the multi-channel dynamic algorithm search, which is right here. Now, one of the things that, that uh, is so subjective is color. What's red to you may be maroon to me. And well, I have special dispensation because I'm colorblind. So it's even more difficult for me to determine colors and to get, uh, get a color right anyway. So if I distill this down into a number, it's significantly easier for me to understand it. And it's a good thing that I'm kind of a, uh, a, a tech geek and that I can go through these and look at these numbers and understand them, so it helps. But with this particular search, all we have to do is to identify which of the primaries we want to use on our search, which means it'll go out and it'll find every instance of this color that we tell it to. Now, that sounds pretty good, but as you can imagine, there are a lot of blue things in pictures, even when there's not much blue to look at. So we have to be able to filter out some of the things that, and filter is not even a good word. You, you have to get above the noise level in those pictures, if you will, so that you can pick out the blue things that are of interest to you. So I've got a, a, a little training session loaded up here that, that we'll go through and we'll try to find something red in these. And uh, the limiter is what we call that to get above the noise level. And, and I'll show you a, a couple of really good examples of how this works. So if we set it down real low, that pretty much says anything red in there, just, just find it for me and, and uh, let's uh, see what it does. So we'll launch it. I had a couple of other files that asked me if I wanted to, to get rid of them. And sure, we'll just get rid of them for this and then we'll let it go. And it loads them up into the queue. And then the algorithm starts parsing away on them. And you can see it goes very, very quickly. And there's all kinds of things going on. And, and uh, it's telling us there's too many clusters in the, these pictures and we get an alarm goes off and it tells us which channel it's in, which is in the blue channel. And over here on the right, we get to see what it's finding. Now, this is a lot of gobbledygook and you don't need to go into understanding that, but we can go over here to the viewer and this viewer works really well. Okay, so you should be able to see that pretty clearly. See all the circles and all the areas that are shown in red? That's what it tells me it found, which is way too much. That's more information than I need. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to... Uh, Gene, you're not... Sh the, it's oh, not it didn't show the view window? No. 
Let me see if I can share my entire screen. Okay, I don't know why this is so different than the other ones. Um, I want to share my entire screen. How about that? There you go. Did that help? That looks good. Do you see the uh, the viewer with the, the red circles? Yes, we do. See these red circles? Yep. Okay, good deal. Now we're finally cooking. I want to make this a little smaller because I've got to get to some controls down here at the bottom. Now, I can do a view original, and, and this will show you dramatically how this will identify all the red things in the picture. So I'm going to hit view original. And see, that's what the picture looks like normally. Okay, so there's really too much information there for us to deal with. So what we're going to do is we're going to close that out. And we're going to go back up here and we are going to up this to 60. Now, obviously, we can go from 0 to 255 here. But we're only going to go to 60. And we will start it again. And it'll warn me that I've got files in there. And we'll start it again. And now I am really giving you the high level view of this. And the way it would work in the field is that you would fine tune this very quickly to, to, uh, to look for the shade or the, the, uh, the object that you're looking for. You see, we're starting to get some, uh, some images saved right here. You see that? Now I'm gonna hit viewer and tell me if the viewer pops up. Nope. No viewer? Oh, yep. Yep. No, nope, it's there now. It's there. Okay. All right. So you see these circles right here? We've still got too many hits in there, but they're a lot less than they were before. One of the things that we can do with the software as we go through, if we need to uh, actually lay eyes on these, is we can hit the Z key and zoom down into it. And the software will tell us what exactly that cluster size is, how many of those clusters fall into our red channel that we're looking for, OK? So I can hit V again to view the normal picture. And there's just a small little piece of red in there. And again, this is, this is only one pixel. So let's go ahead. And uh, we know that that's too many still. So let's bump this up. And we'll go to 80. And we'll rerun it. And, and again, high level view, uh, we're just doing one channel at a time. So you get an idea of, of what we're dealing with. There is information here that tells you just exactly what's going on behind the scenes. And there are other alarms that you can set that help you determine whether you've got a good cluster working or not, and a good uh, search working or not. So we've got five images. Let's go back and view them. See. Now we're significantly reduced. We're, we're actually making some good progress here. And these are some images that I took last week before Snowmageddon hit. And uh, I put some targets out. And these are just one foot red squares. Actually, it's a, it's a, a one foot a uh, piece of plywood with a red bandana on it. You can very clearly see the pattern of the bandana. So we can uh, go through each one of these images very quickly. And this all by itself, if we stopped right there, uh, is such a tremendous boon to be able to, to parse these images, especially during a search. Now, uh, uh, I don't know whether this is going to knock me off the internet, but I'm going to try it. I should be able to come down here and hit show map. 
Okay, you should see a Google map. Do you see it? Yes. Hey, we're cooking with gas now. Okay, this shows a map of where that image was taken. And I can click over to the view of the satellite view, and it'll also give me a pin drop right where that image was taken, which allows me to direct ground searchers to any place, anywhere, anyhow, because this pin drop I can send to a cell phone. So it works extremely well, very, very efficient at being able to get information disseminated. Again, drones deal in huge chunks of data and it's got to be distilled down, especially in the field, so you could distribute it very easily. And this is a, a great way to do it. You just send a URL and as long as the, the, the receiving end has an internet connection or a cellular connection, they can pull up this information. Okay, let's see if I can get lucky here and I'm gonna close this out and go back to our view. So as you can see, this is a very quick process. I mean, you see how quickly it parsed each one of those images. Just last week, we were working on a case in California where there was a 12 year old child missing uh, got swept to sea by a rogue wave. And uh, we were using uh, an i9 computer, laptop, uh, very, very good laptop, but it was processing 20 megapixel images at four images per second. And it would give us this sort of output right here that it would save an incredible amount of time. And unfortunately, we never did get a good result on that. The, the search went for uh, almost three weeks and we parsed 68,000 images. And this is where Locate really shines is being able to parse huge numbers of images because right now a, a drone has, is kind of a one trick pony if you get right down to it. Uh, it's, it's great for situational awareness using video. You can use video and, and get situational awareness and it, and it and works well. Distributing that video is difficult. Uh, you can take all the images that you've gathered and you can do a post process on something like a Pix4D mapper or Agisoft or something like that and come up with these great, huge ortho mosaic images. Again, very difficult to distribute. And while again, it gives you situational awareness, um, what are you gonna do with it after that unless you're doing a survey or doing plat maps or that sort of thing. There's just not that much you can do with it. Now, this is another aspect of what we can do because from this perspective, we can measure things. We know what our ground sampling distance is. So I can tell you that that target is one foot square based on my altitude. So we can start mining data from images and that information that we mine from the, the, the images themselves is easy to distribute. And my phone is blowing up when I get a cell signal, it goes good, huh? So, Because of this, we've been approached by several industries that we never expected, even though this started out in the search and rescue side of it. Uh, we've been approached by uh, uh, botanists for uh, invasive species studies, uh, oil and gas for finding uh, well tags and well markers. Uh, even the mining industry, uh, kind of an interesting deal when, the, when they're working gold mines, they uh, use dynamite to excavate very large swaths. And they need to make sure that all of their people are out of the blast area. So they all have colored uh, hard hats on yellow and, and green and red and whatever. So they want to use this to run before they actually push the detonator to make sure that everybody is out of the pit or out of the mine before they blow it up. 
which I think that's a pretty smart move myself. And, uh, you know, we, we are learning more and more uh, how this can be used in ways that we never even thought about. Search and rescue obviously is the one that, uh, you know, that, that got us here and, and we're gonna continue to, to, to do that. I'm, I work in public safety, uh, I'm a first responder and uh, I'm a drone driver for our county and uh, my fire department. And obviously being able to find something very quickly like this is, is, is significant. And we'll get into some question and answers here, but uh, let, me, let me give you a little bit more about what we're doing developmental wise that may answer some of the questions. Uh, people ask, can you process live video? Most drones will send down live video. Yes, we can. Uh, that's another product called FieldView. Uh, and it will parse the video coming down. And even though the, the video maximum resolution that you can get on the downlink is 1080p, which equates to about three megapixels, we can still see objects, detect objects that are five inches in diameter at 300 feet. So that's still significant. So we can process that through either using internet, we can send that, if you have an internet signal, you can send that to anywhere in the world that is running Locate Field View, and they can do the processing for you. You don't even have to have it there on, on location. Uh, if you don't have internet, we're gonna be using MiFi and uh, HDMI to be able to run it into a laptop that's local, and it will be a concurrent process that you can do in low resolution very quickly. And then when you actually get the, the images down and you transfer them into the laptop, you can do a post-process as well. Another product that we're working on is uh, the FLIR view, where you can analyze FLIR imagery. We obviously in search and rescue use a lot of FLIR imagery at night. And we can actually use the radiometric data that is buried in the FLIR images to help us detect those temperature differences as well. Um, as a side note, one of the things that uh, I'm working with, the Texas State University, they have a forensics anthropology department that we kind of uh, lovingly call the body farm, where they do decomposition studies. And we've got a grant through the NIJ where we are actually trying to detect clandestine graves using drones. So we're making some, that, some really cool science and I really enjoy doing it, but you know, I, I get a lot of flack because I, I have to hang out with dead people, but you know, that's just a part of the, the whole program. And uh, we're making some great strides in using drones in, in forensics as well. And uh, obviously uh, there are other spectrums that we haven't even touched yet uh, near infrared, uh, we're going to be starting multispectral and hyperspectral imagery as well. So we'll start analyzing that uh, coming up probably third quarter this year. Uh, also, are working on a process where uh, you can use full scale aircraft and use very high resolution imagery. Uh, the phase one camera out of Colorado, they, they have 100 megapixel imagery and it makes these huge files. And we've already gotten to the port point where we can actually slice those up and make them manageable and use Locate to, to scan those as well. So with that, I, I know that uh, I, I was a little bit tardy, but uh, I don't want to run long. So I, I'd like to throw it open for questions. And if anybody has any questions, we'll, we'll uh, see if we can get them answered. Awesome, thanks, Gene. Uh... I guess I'll start off and I was telling the group this right before you got on, but you don't remember me, but I remember you, but we've met like five, six years ago or so. And uh, you came to the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire yes. and did a presentation there. Yeah. Yes. And uh, with Dr. Joe Huffey. And there you uh, go. yeah, and I just wanted to, 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 to say thank you for that because that presentation at, at the time of my education was one of those uh, kind of fundamental things that kind of pushed me to get into the UAS industry and all, all the science behind this was is really cool. So, but yeah, but very neat thing. And, and I guess furthermore, uh, my organization is part of the Wisconsin Drone Network 
And I believe that you guys have a, a free version of your locate software that's available for emergency use. Yes. We got, we got called down to do a, a SAR mission um, in a county in Southern Wisconsin. And we went down there and downloaded it on the way and got everything all set up and ready to go. And we ended up finding the, the, the target before the, the drone was even able to get in position. But that, it, it was really nice that that software was readily available for, you know, for our organization. We, don't, we didn't have that. We didn't have it. But we were able to download it right away. I think I contacted uh, one, one of the guys you work with on this is from Canada, I think. Or, uh, yeah, Shane. Was, Shane, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and we were able to get it right away and get all set up. And, and, and that, that tool at least was available for that emergency use, which was really awesome. So. Yeah, and, and we definitely want to invite everybody that's on, the, uh, on this webinar, on this Zoom meeting, uh, if you want to try it, it is free. You can go, and it's not Crippleware, it's a full version. And uh, it's available on uh, www.loc, the number eight, dot life, L-I-F-E. Kind of a nice little play on words there, locate life. And uh, you can try it for yourself. And uh, I've got to tell you, everybody that sees it from a public safety standpoint says that, I mean, this, this is a great step forward. So, and, and my involvement came about because I had been trying to do this for a decade. And, you know, I talked about it even when I was there at Wisconsin years ago about being able to parse that data. Mm -hmm. And Shane and th these guys came through. And when I found out about them, I said, I don't care what it takes. I want to be involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what some of those guys like with... Uh... Mena Arrow and, and JP in Southern Wisconsin too, you know, they've all been able to do a lot of really good work with the software and it, it's been, yep. it's helped a lot of people. And there's a Facebook uh, group there online that, that's, that's kind of out there for these SAR type missions and they use Locate a lot for it. And it's, it's really interesting to, to follow it, see all the, the good use. It's one of those perfect and prime examples of, you know, how our technology and, and especially the UAS industry is, is really being able to fundamentally help, help people and whether it's a recovery mission or a rescue mission, you know, it, it brings closure to a lot of families and it's a, it's a very deep, deep meeting for a lot of people. It, it does, it does. Um, you know, we, we always hope for the best outcome, but uh, you know, that's not always the case. And I can't tell you how many cases much like this one in California that we have that, you know, we may never ever find the, their loved one. And those, those people will have a hole in their lives for the rest of their lives. And, you know, if we can bring closure to that, that's so significant and such an important part of what we do. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Gene? Oh, come on. I couldn't have explained it that good, guys. I know. This is Scott uh, Galetka. We chatted a while ago. Um, I just want to, um, yeah, thank you for uh, coming here today. And, you know, uh, it, it's nice to have the, you know, we have the software here and uh, uh, installed and, you know, we're trying to use it with invasive species. And um, I think yeah. it's just trying to fine tune, fine tune the software and our, our knowledge, I think is, is um, something we're working on right now, but there's a lot of other uses for this, uh, not just the search and rescue side of it. Um, but it, I think that search and rescue situation from our standpoint isn't gonna come too often. And by using it in our daily routine for other uh, aspects, you know, such as the invasive species or, or whatever use that we can use it on, we'll make, our program a little bit better, you know. So one, there is a search and rescue that is uh, that calls us out. We'll, we'll be able to get that done quickly, you know, and confidently. I think is the big thing. You know, Scott, I, I got to tell you, I thought I knew a lot about a JPEG image. I mean, I'd been messing with them for years, and I thought I I knew plenty. This software told me how much I didn't know. I mean, it, it, I, I've had just a real <laughs> learning curve here for, for the last year or so. And, and uh, you're right. The more you use it on, you know, just getting familiar with the data that you're working with, the better off you're going to be. 
And uh, that, that's why it's fun to just get out there and go back into your archives and, and see what you can pull out of stuff that you never knew was there, quite frankly. Yeah, I totally agree, Scott. That's a, that's a great point. You use it for a different purpose so you get experience with it. So when it matters, you're, you're not fumbling around with the software and, and, you, and, you, and you know what to do. I guess I, 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 I guess I could add on to that a little bit. You know, we did a, a training um, with the sheriff's department just before hunting season. We sent a lost hunter out in the woods and, um, you know, we tried to find him. And one of the things is there was a miscommunication, you know, where the, the, the hunter was going to go. I thought he was just going to stay by his truck. And, um, you know, I, I ran the, the, the software and um there's a couple guys um near the trucks that had blaze orange and then he finally came back you know the lost hunter and he's like well did you see me in the woods i was like hmm i don't know i didn't go through all the photos and sure enough it found him you know it was uh it you know found him by accident almost uh, that doesn't surprise me. Uh, there are, I, I went back into my archives as well and, and uh, found some things that I didn't know was there either. But uh, that's the good thing about being able to process these images so quickly. You know, you can take literally hundreds of them and, you know, a few minutes you're done. Yeah, I know we have, uh, like I said, for that Wisconsin drone network um, that we have for a lot of public first responders. Well, now we have a training coming up in March, and this is kind of a pitch to everybody else that's in this group. But uh, a lot of people within Wisconsin drone that are law enforcement and people of that sort, and uh, and they have that that kind of background. Then there's people like myself who's more of like the pilot. Um, but there's also a great need to have other people, even if you don't have an aircraft, other people just to assist with things like things of this sort. We have a training coming from March and we're doing uh, an outdoor search and rescue, search and recovery training. And it'd be great It'd be great to have this software as part of the training because it, this is a huge part. And I, I don't think a lot of people uh, utilize it. So even if you want to become part of that Wisconsin drone network as a uh, as almost like a software specialist, you don't have to be in a law enforcement office at your organization. You can still join and, and, um, and, and become part of the team. I would be absolutely delighted to help you with that. Um, public safety is, I mean, since I am a first responder as well, you know, near and dear to my heart. So yeah, I would be tickled to death to do that. We make sure, let me know so we can get you set up. And rather than using the, uh, the Locate Pro that we have, which is with the color databases, we'll get you guys set up with the MDAS, what we call MDAS, multi-dynamic, multi-channel dynamic algorithm search. And you'll, you'll be amazed at how much easier it is to be able to conduct those searches when you know you have primary colors like red, green, and blue. And we didn't even talk about the, the, uh, the, the secondary colors, the, the in-between colors, if you will. So we can actually do those with this. So you can get the yellows and the, the purples and cyans and the magentas. So, you know, it, it's, it's so much quicker and so much easier to do rather than trying to zero in on a, on a single color. Uh, it gives you an entire band to search instead of, you know, a small area of the spectrum to search. So yeah, I'd be tickled to death to help with that. Awesome, well, I just wrote myself a reminder to get that set up. <laughs> okay, good deal. And, you know, again, guys, uh, I'm, I have been to your state. I've been to 31 other states doing search and rescue. If you ever have one that you need help with, it all, you know all you got to do is drop me up uh, an email or, or call me or whatever. You know, there's plenty of ways to get a hold of me, and I'd be happy to help. Gene, would you mind if I dropped your email in the uh, chat box? Do it. Uh, absolutely. It's that centric flyer at Gmail? That would do it. Awesome. Yeah, and whether it's law enforcement or, you know, uh, uh, civilian volunteer groups or anything else, wh whoever is mobilized on the search, I'll be more than happy to help. 
Awesome. Thanks again, Gene. Well, if anybody, does anybody else have any other questions for Gene? Hearing none, we'll uh, wrap it up, Gene. Once again, thank you very much for coming out and, and, uh, and speaking to us today. This is, this is really interesting for us mapping people because it's not something that we're used to in everyday you know, office environment uh, type work. So it's a, but, but it's a really good, useful tool to kind of give us exposure to it because we may be the people who are asked by our local law enforcement to assist in these types of projects because we have experience in this type of software and whatnot. So it's really important for everybody to kind of learn about that even if you're not in the UIS. So thanks, Gene, really appreciate yep. it. You're absolutely